I would like to wel welcome you to our uh, Ash Wednesday noon service. Thank you for coming out today. Somebody wave at me if it's coming through the FM, okay? Yeah, good. Um, thank you. And uh, um, we, we begin our, we, we, let me just start again. I, I'm grateful that you're here for Ash Wednesday. Much of this service is symbolic in nature. Symbols carry huge amounts of meaning. And so as we receive the ashes, as we receive Holy Communion, as we hear the words of the examination of our conscience, as we make our confession unto God, we, um, we, we gather a, as God's people in, in holy movement of faith. We'll, be, um, we'll begin our worship service with our opening song, Lord Jesus, think on me. Lord Jesus, think on me and purge away my sin from selfish passion set me free and make me pure within Lord Jesus think on me by anxious thoughts of let me O loving servant be promised rest Lord Jesus begins with these words from Joel chapter 2. Return to the Lord your God, who is gracious and merciful. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you hate nothing you have made, and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and honest hearts, so that truly repenting of our sins, we may receive from you the God of all mercy, full pardon and forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. reading comes to us from Joel, the second chapter. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave behind a, and leave 
a blessing behind him, a grain offering, and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will now read from Psalm 51 responsively. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words, and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in the truth and the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, for I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Fill up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bowls will be offered on your altar. We continue with the special Ash Wednesday uh, liturgy and examination of conscience. For our examination of conscience, please prayerfully and meditatively reflect as these questions are, are read. In regard to myself, have I, through mediocrity, excused myself from guilt because a sin is habitual or caused by social pressure? Have I acted because of whims and feeling, used time ineffectively, organized myself so intensely that I'm no longer capable of spontaneous generosity? Have I, through disorder and lack of planning, used material possessions improperly, 
been weak in making and holding to decisions, lacked perseverance and logic in carrying things out, left work half done without serious reason, been discouraged by difficulties or setbacks, failed to take time for being alone, for reflection, for reconciliation. Have I through pride and vanity been vain and praise-loving, proud and smug, indulged in allowing my feelings to be hurt, acted out of ambition or the desire to be noticed, failed to recognize my limits and accept them, made snap judgments and comments to give the impression I know all about a subject. In regard to others, have I, against charity, loved others selfishly, wanted to monopolize others' affections, been jealous, considered no one but myself, never felt real anguish for the misery of others, passed by indifferent to others' troubles, had habitual contempt for others, less educated people, people of different racial, national, or economic groups. In any way, have I stifled the personal development of another, sought to be respected without respecting others, often kept others waiting, not paid entire attention to a person speaking to me, talked too much of myself and not given others a chance to express themselves, failed to try to understand others, out of selfishness or pride expected to be served, failed to help a person in distress, seen only those whose friendship might prove profitable, abandoned my friends in their difficulties, said hurtful things, done harm by remarks, false or true, that blacken others' character, betrayed a trust or violated a confidence, given scandal by the split between the life I lead and the principles I advertise as mine. In regard to my family, have I, in family matters, made my family and its affairs my sole occupation, failed to be a full partner and source of strength to my spouse, taken for my own use the unfair share of what our family has, clothes or car or free time, have I failed to respect the individuality of another, even a child? Expected more of a child than I have courage to do myself? Talked idly and indiscreetly about the faults of those close to me? In regard to the church, have I by thoughts never read or reflected on the Holy Scriptures? Not held myself responsible for my part in the inadequacy of Christians? by words, criticized irresponsibly the leadership of the church, both clerical and lay, ignored the teaching authority of the church, replacing it with my own authority. By acts have I run away from trying to solve the church's internal problems, acted to support the church only when it met my approval. By omission have I not tried to make the church more vital failed to contribute sacrificially for the material needs of the church, neglected to pray for those in authority. Toward God, have I not seen and loved God in other persons, not loved others in God, thought of Jesus Christ, but not tried to make him my model, not made an effort to bear with him the sins of the world, especially those of my own social group? Have I centered the cross on my walls, but not in my life? Have I talked about Christ without really trying to live the gospel? Have I not found time to pray? Prayed only to ask, never to adore, never to thank, never to act as a member of the mystical body, never to love. Have I thought of spiritual life as something to do only after everything else has been taken care of? Brothers and sisters, the exhortation. Brothers and sisters, God created us to experience joy in communion with him 
to love all humanity, and to live in harmony with all his creation. But sin separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation. And so we do not enjoy the life our Creator intended for us. Also, by our sin, we grieve our Father, who does not desire us to come under his judgment, but to turn to him and live. As disciples of the Lord Jesus, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from love of God and neighbor. Repentance, fasting, prayer, and works of love, the discipline of Lent, help us to wage our spiritual warfare. I invite you, therefore, to commit yourself to this struggle, to confess your sins, asking our Father for strength to persevere in your Lenten discipline. So now let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. After each response, um, I'll say, God of mercy, and you will say, hear our prayer. And I, I'm going to change that. I'm going to say, O oh, most holy God, and you respond, have mercy on us. Most holy and merciful God, we confess to you and to one another and before the whole company of heaven that we have sinned by our fault, by our own fault, by, and, and, uh, by our own most grievous fault, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. O oh, most holy God, have mercy on us. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. O oh, most holy God, have mercy on us. We have shut our ears to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. O oh, most holy God, our past unfaithfulness, the pride, envy, hypocrisy, and apathy that have infected our lives. We confess to you, O oh, most holy God. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways and our exploitation of other people, we confess to you, O oh, most holy God. Our negligence in prayer and worship and our failure to share the faith that is in us, we confess to you, O oh, most holy God. Our neglect of human need and suffering and our indifference to injustice and cruelty, we confess to you, O oh, most holy God. Our false judgments, our uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors, and our prejudice and contempt toward those who differ from us, we confess to you, O oh, most holy God. Our waste and pollution of your creation, and our lack of concern for those who have come after us, we confess to you, O oh, most holy God. Restore us, O oh God, and let your anger depart from us. Hear us, O oh God, for your mercy is great, O oh, most holy God. At this time, we're going to come around to every vehicle and bring the imposition of ashes. First, you'll see Karen do me and, and uh, Nina. And then Karen and I will come around to each of the vehicles and bring the imposition of ashes to you.
Let us pray. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Savior, bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Hear the word of absolution. Almighty God has had mercy on you, he forgives you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. May he now strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you 
into eternal life. Amen. At this time, our service continues with the reading of the second lesson. Our second lesson is from 2 Corinthians um, chapter 5, beginning in the 20th verse. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful. The Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. We read verses 1 through 6 and 16 through 21. Jesus said to the disciples, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy dogs and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also the gospel of the lord praise to you O christ I entitled my sermon today, The Audience of One. I remember a time where we, several times in our marriage, have, have owned a Suburban as a vehicle, a very long vehicle. At the time we owned our first Suburban, we also had a VW Rabbit. When we parked the two vehicles together, it looked like a, a mom or daddy car and a little baby car parked right next to each other. Um, I remember one day thinking about this, this sense of how many people are watching, or, or this, my sermon title, an audience of one. I remember going into a nearby town, a small town in, in Minnesota, 
and they had parallel parking along the curb. And uh, there was one spot open, and it was just a regularly sized uh, parking space along the curb with a car on in front and behind uh, that parking space. And so I lined up carefully, and I backed in with one move and was done. I was less than a foot from the curb. I was equally spaced from the bumper in front of me and the bumper behind me. In one move, I parked that car, and I got out of the car, and I immediately looked around the block to see if anybody saw how great a job whatever. We often live our lives concerned with what other people think, with what other people say. We, we worry often about ourselves. We come to worship and, and we may not sing real loudly because we don't have good voices. Um, but, but that would mean we're, we're really concerned about how other people hear us or even how we hear ourselves, but, but God always looks at the heart. When we worship God, it's, it's not about the band. It's not about the band and, 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 and what we, we get out of them, or, or it's, it's not about the preacher. It, it's really not even about you. But the issue is, when we're sitting in worship, are we attentive to the audience of our worship? God is there. He is listening to our prayers. He is... The, the radio went off. Hold on a second. Can you hear me on the FM radio? Okay, we're good. Um, it might be your vehicle. Thanks, John. When, when, we, when we, we gather, our audience is God. When we live our lives, God is watching us always. I love Psalm 139. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I understand your thoughts from afar. Before there is a word on, your tongue, on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. God is fully present with us. The promise of Jesus is the reality of God. I will never leave you or forsake you. He is always present with us. There is always, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, whatever we're thinking, whatever we're saying, God is present with us and there is an audience of one. And I'd like to focus my thoughts on this one. We hear in Joel the call to repentance. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. With fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. We hear from St. Paul in the second lesson, but now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. We hear from the psalmist pleading after pleading, have mercy on me, O God. Wash me. Blot out my transgressions. Purge me. Blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. Wash me. Renew a right spirit. Restore me. Deliver me. Open my lips. We're calling out to God because we know in front of the audience of one, our lives fall far short of his will for us. Some days... We're more aware of it than others. Other days, like today, are special days where we can pause to think through the examination of conscience, questions that spur us on to ask basically, where is God speaking to us in our lives? He knows we're not everything we ought to be. But he's calling us to be shaped into his image. And to be shaped into the image of God. And so, where we hear God's voice speaking, as I know in one area of my life, I've been listening to God for the last three weeks, very intently, because he spoke to me very clearly three weeks and one day ago. 
And I needed to repent of sin and learn to listen to his voice and follow him in that area of my life. He's always calling because he knows that sin separates us from him and each other and is not good for us. And he desires his blessings to be poured out upon us. And so he comes to speak. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Return to the Lord. Why? Because we hear. He is gracious and merciful. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over punishment or disaster. We hear from the psalmist, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. We hear, have mercy on me, O oh God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Paul tells us how Christ does, how God does this. He says in, in the beginning of our second lesson, be, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ, the living God who came to earth, came to die on the cross, and on the cross, he took all of your sin on himself. And because he has taken your sin, he has blotted it all, absorbed it from you into himself. You are left with the righteousness of God. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that if you are in him, baptized and believing, we become the righteousness of God. It, it's unfathomable, this great exchange that God gives to us. And as he looks at us, he looks at us as he looks at his son, completely forgiven and made whole. So Paul says, now is the favorable time, and now is the day of salvation. There's an interesting phrase I'd like to close with in, in Matthew's Gospel about God being the audience before whom we live our lives and what a great God he is. It's after each of those false pieties, giving to the needy, praying, or fasting, only so people see what we're doing in being so good to needy people, or fasting so religiously, or praying so fabulously that when we're worried about the audience of everybody but God, God will give us what we deserve. People will see us, but he will pay no attention. If you've done it that way, you've received your word, but if you, we live in the true piety, whether we, we give to others, or pray, or fast, or read the word, when we live in true piety, when we, we do those things in secret, we're told your Father who sees in secret will reward you. The word see is an interesting word. If you joined me last night for the devotion online at 7 o'clock, we had on Monday and Tuesday the story of Abraham and the sacrifice of Isaac. We'll continue that story tomorrow night for devotions on Thursday evening. But in that devotion, I talked about uh, at the end of the portion where, where Abraham is, has taken up the knife to slay his son and the angel of the Lord says, Abraham, Abraham, and he says, here I am. He says, do not harm the boy, for now I know that you fully trust in me. And then he opened his eyes and he saw a ram caught by its horns in the bush. And he went ahead and sacrificed the ram in, in place of his son Isaac. And he named the place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day on the Mount of the Lord, 
it will be provided. The Lord shall provide. The word provide is literally in the Hebrew the word see. Because when God sees you, he comes to you and he rescues you. We're told that in the bondage to e Egypt, the, that God saw and heard the, the cry of the people and he saw their affliction and he came and rescued them. When God sees, God saves. That's why the word uh, in, uh, in Genesis, in the story of Abraham and Isaac, is that God sees and God provides. And so in our gospel lesson, we have the same word here that was in Hebrew, the same word used here in Greek. Your Father who sees in heaven will reward you. Your Father who sees. When our audience is one, the Father who sees, he will provide all that you need. It's one of these great promises of the scriptures. The one who sees is the one who provides. And so it doesn't matter who else is listening to us or who else is watching us. They are not the ones who will provide. It is only the Lord God who both sees and provides. We live our lives before the audience of one. And the good news is he is watching over you. And you may live your life before.